Um, once again, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this uh, is uh, the Roche uh, Foundation Medicine Symposium, um, tackling precision medicine and how we optimize patient treatment plans by genomic profiling and molecular tumor boards, something that we are hearing uh, quite a bit about uh, in the past couple of years. I think Roche and Foundation Medicine have done actually a great job in um, sort of spreading the word about how well or how much we need precision medicine. And it's also something that we need with uh, the amount and the number of drugs that have been evolving with robust data from each and every drug. And I think this uh, is really going to be sort of um, hopefully beneficial from, for our patients. Um, with me today um, in this uh, symposium is uh, my mentor, Professor Hamdi Ablazim. Oh, Professor Hamdi is a well-renowned world expert on breast cancer. Uh, Professor uh, Amr Shafi as well from uh, Cairo, from Ain Shams University. I think Amr is online with us. And then we've got our distinguished uh, speakers from uh, uh, around the world. We've got uh, Dr. Benedict, who is from the University of uh, Munich, member of the ESMO uh, Transitional Research and Precision Medicine Working Group. He's also one of the people who is putting the guidelines for uh, the ESMO recommendation on molecular profiling. Dr. Frederic, uh, uh, Professor of Molecular Pathology, uh, Center of Jean uh, Pernin, University of Clément uh, Fernand, I hope I pronounce that well, and Dr. Giuseppe uh, uh, Valle, who is a professor of pathology from the University of Milan and European Institute of Oncology from uh, Milan. Thank you all for being with us uh, today. We've got uh, quite the audience on the virtual, which has become uh, the norm today. I think we are going to have three parts for this. We're going to start off with Dr. Uh, Benedict who is going to give uh, a role, uh, the precision medicine and the role of comprehensive genomic profiling, the ESMO uh, NGS guidelines. Then we are going to go to Dr. Giuseppe, who is going to uh, talk about the role of molecular pathologists and molecular tumor boards, something that we still are lagging behind here uh, in Egypt. And then we'll have a couple of cases uh, uh, from Professor Hamdi, Professor uh, Am as well as uh, uh, Professor uh, Frederic, uh, who will pre be presenting a couple of cases that we can all uh, sort of jump on uh, into. So without uh, delaying this further, Professor Benedict, can you please start off with your talk? Thank you. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Benedikt Westphalen from um, Germany. I'm a molecular uh, biologist and medical oncologist, and I run the Precision Oncology Program at my institution. And it's my great pleasure to talk to you about precision oncology in 2021 and the road ahead. So these are my conflicts of interest. Um, I believe in 2021, we now have almost all pieces together to complete this precision oncology puzzle um, around genes, around the right drug for the right patient. And I would like to outline what we have to do in the next couple of years to really bring the idea of precision oncology and personalized medicine to reality and how comprehensive genomic profiling can help in this regard. So the concept behind precision medicine and especially in um, precision oncology is that you use novel techniques um, to better define the patients that you see in your practice and then in the end um, to treat them according to their personalized disease. The promise is that by individualizing treatment, we will have less side effects it will be more cost effective because we choose the right drug for the right patient. And in the end, this will improve um, the patient's outcome. And we've known for a couple of years now, and this is um, data from the MSKCC impact program, that if you use tumor profiling, you're able to drive innovation. 
And um, what you see here in this Nature Medicine article from 2017 is how many patients have been enrolled in molecular guided clinical trials at MSKCC. And when you turn your attention to the right hand side of the slide, the yellow bars, these are extremely rare alterations when you look in a histology agnostic fashion. And you won't find them by randomly looking just um, with one gene. You need comprehensive tumor profiling to get a full picture of your um, patient's disease. And what we see right now in this um, paper, almost six years old now, is legendary, that we um, move more and more from disease-focused to histology agnostic treatments. Pembrolizumab, first in DMMR and now also in TMB high cancers, was the first drug to be um, approved by the FDA in a histology agnostic fashion. So any patient that has a TMB high or DMMR tumor can now receive pembrolizumab regardless of um, the origin of the disease. And we now see this um, in a lot of um, other um, areas with a lot of other biomarkers, namely TRK fusion driven tumors, extremely rare events. But if you find a patient with such a um, TRK fusion, um, you see again response um, across a variety of um, tumors. This is data from the intractinib study. You also have larotractinib um, being approved. And then now pre uh, prelcetinib um, or blue 667 uh, targeting red driven cancers. And again, you see very, very promising histology agnostic um, activity across a broad range of cancers. Again, these are very rare alterations in a variety of tumors, and you won't find them by um, looking randomly. You need to have comprehensive genomic profiling to get the full picture of your patient. We also target um, alterations that have been um, named undruggable, namely KERAS. And last year, Sotorasib showed activity in non-small cell lung cancer, but also to a certain extent in colorectal cancer. And since you see KRAS G12C mutations, again, across a broad range, it will be important to also look at um, this in a broader fashion. And what I believe, and this slide has been provided by um, Roche, um, is that we find ourselves at a tipping point. So you see here um, relevant biomarkers that will, if all the phase two and three trials that are on ongoing as of today will yield promising results, we will have up to 15 drugs that are um, based on rare biomarkers and will most probably be approved or at least target multiple different diseases or approved in a histology agnostic fashion. So with this rapid um, development and this promising landscape, it will be very, very important for us as, as oncologists to really have our patients diagnosed appropriately. But there are roadblocks at the very moment in precision oncology, and one of them being access to therapy. So when you talk about precision oncology today, you will have um, people telling you, well, it has never worked. Um, this is data that we have compiled for ESMO Oncology Pro um, two years ago. And when you look at randomized or non-randomized trials that were trying to test histology agnostic precision oncology over the last couple of years, trials like Shiva or Profiler, you had a large number of patients in these trials included. And in the end, the overall response rate was very low. Yet. This was with the old drugs. And now I believe we're at the point where access to therapy is really um, ramping up. And thus, it still is where it becomes even more important to properly diagnose patients using broad comprehensive genomic profiling and thus get all the information you need to make um, a good decision for your patient. There are a lot of questions and I've just put them up here. This is based on a large survey that we have done where we see problems. So 
who now should undergo extended molecular diagnostics. Um, Precision oncology is not taught in medical schools up to now, and we have to adapt to this new um, reality. It is important that we define what is a molecular target, and I will go to that um, in a second. Then molecular tumor boards become um, a mainstay in precision oncology, so we need to think about what a molecular tumor board is in the end. Access to treatment I have covered. It is important in this very, very specialized medicine that we also look what happens with our patients in these personalized treatment approaches. And in the end, and I don't want to forget to talk about this, this is costly medicine. And we need to think about reimbursement of um, the testing driving innovation here. But, and I want to make a very, very strong argument here, genomic profiling is needed these drugs have made it into clinical um, practice. Also, as I've shown you in the beginning, a lot of molecular guided clinical trials are not now ongoing. So we need to find patients to offer novel and innovative therapeutics to them within the framework of a clinical trial. And then also research and development are driven by tumor profiles. You just learn about your patients on the fly. So what are we going to test? Back in the days, we did single gene testings um, like um, KRAS in uh, colorectal cancer. Um, this is very limited um, information nowadays, and it's cheap. In the end, what um, will become reality maybe in the future is that you have the whole genome tested. At the very um, moment, targeted comprehensive genomic um, panels are our working horse and they become available, broadly available, they become cheaper. So this is what we have to do um, at the moment using comprehensive genomic um, profiling panels that cover the whole range. Why do we need molecular tumor boards at the more, uh, moment? There is a huge amount of data out there. There is uncertainty about the evidence underlying um, the, those molecular targeted agents. So molecular tumor boards discussing the results of comprehensive genomic profiling can offer therapeutic and diagnostic guidance, answering the question, is it really good for my patient to do um, the profiling? We believe, and this is what I believe is very, very important in the future, that these tumor boards can serve as um, a knowledge hub and an accelerator of um, precision oncology. It's important to integrate these results into a clinical care um, plan and define what is therapeutically relevant and what not. Where do we get the idea or um, the, the backing what is therapeutically relevant in, um, at the moment? There have been put forward a huge amount of evidence frameworks. And my colleague from Heidelberg, um, Dr. Leisenring, um, brought up this very nice International Journal of Cancer manuscript, trying to consolidate all the different evidence frameworks um, that are out there from the American um, Patho pathology and ASCO um, societies over to ESMO, the National Center of Tumor Disease in Germany. Um, this is really a good paper to get an idea how different um, grading systems for the grading of molecular alterations work. Today, I would like to focus um, on ESMO and the S-cut scale because this has been the mainstay and the backbone for um, the recommendations that I'm uh, going to present you today. So we at ESMO really um, asked ourselves the question, in metastatic cancer patients, which patients should undergo comprehensive genomic profiling by NGS to really drive their um, therapeutic management? And um, I've put you the methodical approach on the right side to show you how we did this with a large effort um, and a lot of um, esteemed colleagues being involved. And we really came up with the idea that it would be uh, appropriate to come up with a number needed to test um, how many genes, how many alterations do you need to test um, to cover all your bases. 
And this is how we came up with the 2020 recommendations. Um, I'm not going to read this slide to you. I'm just um, going to say that we came up with non-small cell lung cancer, prostate, ovarian cancer, and cholangiocarcinoma as the poster trials for precision oncology in um, 2020. There are other um, diseases like colon cancer where you have to test for all RAS, for MSI, for BRAF, where um, an NGS panel cut, could substitute for sing, uh, single biomarker testing. And then um, if you believe in the um, results of Keynote 158, tumor mutational burden becomes important in a variety of other um, diseases um, shown at the bottom of the slide. And to show you how this looks, this is a busy slide, but just to show you how far we've come in the last couple of years, on the left-hand side of the slide, um, all the genomics alterations graded by the ESCAT scale um, in non-small cell lung cancer. And it's crystal clear that it wouldn't make any sense to do this on a gene-by-gene -gene, um, basis. Here you need to have um, comprehensive genomic profiling to have all the relevant biomarkers addressed as once. This is tissue sparing and it's also cost-effective. But then a disease like cholangiocarcinoma, which has been um, a disease with dismal prognosis, almost as bad as um, pancreatic cancer, has really become the new kid on the block in precision oncology. And with all the biomarkers that you see on the left hand um, side, um, on the right hand side of the slide, it became from being in the dark to really coming into the spotlight. And you have very, very promising data um, that precision oncology is really going to change the management in cholangiocarcinoma. For example, based on data um, of the Moscato trial, but also um, on the trials mentioned here. Also, it is important to remember that the data in other diseases is limited, but we as, at ASMO want to highlight that comprehensive genomic profiling can be beneficial to patients if it's not um, causing extra cost for the public health care system. It can help you to screen patients for eligible um, clinical trials and accelerate drug development. So we should really think about together as, um, as multi-stakeholders to um, come together how we make testing available to our patients. So far, so good. We also need to think about how to properly um, educate our peers. This is data from a legendary paper published in the JCO 2014, and I believe this has um, changed, but this is data from Harvard Medical School. And um, what we really saw here is that um, even at a major academic um, center, um, oncologists were not really confident about how to apply um, comprehensive genomic pro um, profiling and um, novel therapeutics into their um, diagnostic and therapeutic workup. And that is why it is really important. And this is why I um, applaud um, today's um, organizers of the meeting to really bring precision oncology into the focus so that we can um, teach our younger peers um, about um, the chances and challenges here. What we envision in the end is something that we called integrated precision oncology. It's not enough to just have clinical trials or a molecular tumor board or a state-of-the-art diagnostics facility. You need to bring all these components together to unleash the full potential for our patients in the years to come. So my conclusions of this talk, omics-driven precision um, cancer medicine is clinical reality. Medical reality now really needs to catch up. Um, in terms of medical education, in terms of clinical practice, and um, I made my focus on access uh, to testing and to um, these therapeutics, we need to think about um, modern trial um, design and how we um, generate data in the future. Real world evidence uh, is one of the buzzwords here. And also we need to think about drug approval and um, novel drug design in terms of precision oncology.
And with this, I come to a conclusion and I hope I make clear that it's really about teamwork and this is part of my team at University of Munich. And I thank you so much for your attention and um, I'm happy to discuss questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Benedict. And next we'll be going to uh, Professor Giuseppe. Uh, talking on the role of molecular uh, pathologists and the molecular tumor boards. Professor Giuseppe, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be with you today. Um, so I think uh, <clears throat> we will try and try to put in practice some of the principles that have been uh, highlighted just now, uh, trying to figure out the role of molecular pathologists in the uh, molecular tumor board. Uh, so first of all, who is the molecular pathologist? Uh, I think molecular pathologist is a person with a solid pathology background, which is now proficient in assessing the status of molecules. Uh, and molecules are proteins and nucleic acids mainly. Using the appropriate testing for both proteins and nucleic acids, like immunohistochemistry, in situ hybridization, and different assays for DNA analysis, either PCR based assays or next generation sequencing and gene expression profiling. Uh, these people, these molecular pathologists, are essential for establishing precision medicine programs. And the assumptions for a, a precision oncology is that genetic aberration exists in human malignancies and uh, some of them... Professor, Professor Giuseppe, can you make your screen full screen because I think we, you're not shifting them. It's. I think it's it's full screen. Uh, we can see the th things on the side, so I think maybe it's not. Uh, and the slides are not changing, sir. Oh. So how can we get there? Are you now seeing this light? Yeah, it's the same. We, we can oh. see the, uh, the, it's the slide, the title, the role of molecular pathologist in MBT. Uh oh. Click uh, the screen, I think, and then the slides will go on. Yeah. Are they moving now? No. Um, I think maybe you can stop sharing. And then share again. Sharing again, yes. Sorry. I will try. Yes. Uh, They're changing. Yeah, I think maybe you can change them from the side. We can see now personalized precision cancer medicine. Okay, assumptions. the assumptions. Yeah. If you can so go to full I screen. I will try to put yeah. in full screen. Yeah. Is it okay? Yes, great. Thank you. Yes, perfect. Thank you. So these are the assumptions of, uh, uh, of the uh, precision cancer medicine. So genetic aberrations exist in human malignancies. They may, some of them will drive oncogenesis and tumor progressions. And at least some of these may be potentially actionable. And the assumption is that we will be able to find uh, tolerable and effective medicinal compounds to target these aberrations. Uh, and the objective of, of, of this precision oncology is to target the molecular pathways that drive tumor progression, knowing that these pathways are individual. And so the objective is to identify the molecular mechanisms of progression that are active at the individual level. So personalized medicine. By using drugs or drug combinations that will eventually inhibit these pathways. 
is is that easy? No, we have plenty of challenges to achieve uh, personalized oncology. First of all, we already know that each tumor has numerous gene aberrations, and within the same tumor, there is heterogeneity in the in these gene aberrations. Moreover, during the neoplastic progressions, new clones will emerge with new aberrations. Then, tumors are able to have a number of resistant mechanisms. Not all gene aberrations are actionable, and unfortunately, not all drug combinations are tolerable by the patients. So, how can we try and address these challenges? Well, there are a number of questions that we have to, to try and answer. Uh, if there is heterogeneity within that uh, given tumor, how many samples of a primary tumor should undergo uh, uh, genetic analysis? If there is heterogeneity during the metastatic process, how many biopsies of different metastatic sites should be done at progression? Should we take advantage of circulating tumor cells or tumor DNA? Are we able to distinguish between driver versus passenger mutations? So all these questions are best addressed in the uh, multidisciplinary in a multidisciplinary manner within the uh, multidisciplinary tumor board. Uh, this this uh, multidisciplinary tumor boards have different roles. Uh, uh, First of all, they should integrate a, a comprehensive review of patient characteristics, which will include clinical history, imaging, pathology, laboratory results, and molecular profiling. And we have to provide an effective workflow and uh, an expert review process to facilitate interpretation of molecular data that are complex in order to be able to generate precision medicine recommendations for our patients. Uh, we want to develop a treatment plan uh, with the assistance of clinical trial coordinators and uh, specialists in medical uh, acquisitions to facilitate drug availability. And last but not least, one of the roles of Molecular Tumor Board is to provide education on molecular assays on their findings and how these will eventually relate to treatment strategies. Uh, what is the uh, a possible uh, molecular tumor board flow chart? Well, first of all, we have to identify candidate patients to molecular testing. And this is something that, uh, uh, the, the, let's say, the executive committee of the Molecular Tumor Board, which mainly is, is uh, uh, represented by oncologists and molecular pathologists, they have to identify the candidate patients. Uh, what we have to know from the uh, oncologist's point of view is the identification of patients whose tumor is resistant to treatment or is recurring with no recognized standard of care that are currently available or malignant neoplasms of a non-primary or a non-differentiation. Also, patients with a strong family history of cancer or with hereditary syndromes may be candidate for molecular testing. Patients with tumors of mixed histology or of rare histology. And of course, always we have to know the performance status of the patient in order to see what is the expectation in terms of, of, of uh, uh, availability of, of drugs and tolerability. What is the role of the uh, molecular pathologist? Uh, well, first of all, we have to ensure availability of adequate and appropriate tissue. In case of multiple samples available, we have to select the most suitable sample. We have to decide whether to work on the primary tumor or in metastasis, if we may use histological or cytological samples, or whether we have to go to liquid biopsy. And then the molecular pathologist has to identify and to propose the best molecular assay, uh, targeted assays versus multiplexed assays, and panel size for uh, next generation sequencing. 
And then we will go to the uh, second step of the uh, flowchart of Moika Tumor Board, which is the case presentation and discussion. Normally in the molecular tumor board there are several participants, oncologists, molecular pathologists, geneticists, bioinformaticians, clinical trial navigators, and also we may have surgeons, radiologists, pharmacists, and in some cases it is also been suggested to have patients uh, representative in the in the tumor, in the board. And the output of the discussion is to provide recommendations. It may be standard therapies or of label therapies. We may have the opportunity of uh, uh, recommending genetic counseling and germline testing in case we have found some mutation that may be germline mutations. And then we have to know whether we have available clinical trials or if we can address the patients to centers where clinical trials uh, uh, proper clinical trials are run, and finally, the, uh, the, the one of the output of the discussion could be a classification of tumors that originally were considered of unknown origin. So, my take home is that uh, uh, both patients and physicians truly benefit from the molecular tumor board review because molecular tumor boards uh, may not only optimize patient management, but also provide a very important educational forum, both for patients and physicians. We will have the opportunity of uh, making more precise th therapeutic recommendations. We will provide support, interpretive support, and more informed decisions that may be used uh, while discussing with the patient and trying to find the best uh, uh, solution for, for the disease. And finally, scientists like the molecular pathologist may draw the oncologist's attention to matters of scientific relevance which could otherwise be missed. So these, I think, are the main features of the molecular tumor board and uh, certainly setting uh, a molecular tumor board may be a very important step forward towards uh, uh, a, a definite uh, uh, personalized treatment and uh, uh, a new uh, oncology pattern. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Jeffrey. Thank you very much. I think uh, this is all well, precision medicine, talking about precision medicine and targetable uh, uh, therapies for each and every cancer. It seems sort of like a dream, but it's actually uh, a reality that is changing uh, lives of patients today. For having said that, we have three very interesting cases. Uh, one will, or oh, the first one will be presented by Professor uh, Hamdi Ablazim. And then the next will be, or the next two will be presented by uh, Professor uh, Frederic. We'll have all of us uh, here, and for once, as we've said, we're going to have the molecular pathologist, Dr. Giuseppe, with us uh, on board in, uh, on these cases. Professor Hamni, please start. These are actual cases that are ongoing um, treatment and have done this uh, Foundation One Medicine. Just to give the audience a feel of what it's really like in, in the live, uh, in, in live practice. Professor Hamni, please. Okay, good, uh, good afternoon, my dear colleagues and friends. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed the presentation, of course, of uh, Dr. Vialli uh, and Dr. Benedict, and uh, I'll try to build on that uh, in uh, our, our situation in, in Egypt, which is uh, similar to the majority of the countries across the world when it comes to, to uh, uh, molecular tumor board because the item does not really exist at the present time, uh, uh, apart from um, 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 some uh, uh, European countries from the west side of Europe and uh, in North America, the, the majority of the countries all over the world, so they, they do not really enjoy having this kind of uh, uh, molecular tumor boards, which as Dr. Vialli uh, mentioned, they encompass treatment uh, team, broad treatment team, the, the leader should be the molecular biologist, of course, but uh, with the oncologist and, and uh, 
genetist. Uh, uh, I did not mention in my slide the bioinformatic uh, uh, experts, and uh, I did not mention the clinical trial navigator and the drug access uh, uh, specialist pharmacist, because the item does not exist in, 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 in my country, in our country here, like in so many other countries. So uh, we need to build uh, up for, for the next uh, coming years to have at least one central uh, molecular tumor board in, in, in Egypt. Uh, the case is discussed, as mentioned by my colleagues be before, uh, in order to have the clinical information and uh, the, the modern molecular diagnostics, which you, we heard a lot from Dr. Benedict about this. Uh, the molecular tumor board, they aim to provide clinical solutions, as we, we have seen, and the guide patients to clinical trials. Again, uh, we have a lot of, of, uh, of challenges all over the world, of, and of course in, 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 in many countries outside Europe and, and US, where we have very limited uh, access to clinical trial, the, the, the drug-free access uh, programs, they, they, they are not applicable in, in, in Egypt like the vast majority of, of countries. So th the challenges are, are really there. And we have seen uh, from the presentation of Dr. Benedict that if you start with 1,000 patients, the, the, you, you, you may benefit by the end of the day uh, up to 8% 8, 8 that will will do the full journey from molecular testing to identifying of, of action with uh, mutation to have an access of, of, of a drug and then to have this drug responding uh, in, in a given patient. So uh, we know the good thing now is we have a growing number of recommendations for off-label therapies that uh, we have a drug that works well in certain disease and Dr. Bennett have, has thrown lights on that. Uh, that you can crisscross using uh, the same drug in other disease histology, having the same molecular aberration. Having said so, I will take you to our clinic. Uh, the, the, this patient, he's a, 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 he was a heavy smoker uh, that, that had extensive uh, chest symptoms related to pericardial effusion. The workup uh, revealed uh, uh, several uh, uh, mediastinal nodes. And, and, and one small uh, left lung uh, primary bilateral pleural effusion and uh, plenty of abdominal nodes as well by, uh, shown by the PET scan. And uh, uh, the, the, the first thing was to evacuate the pericardial effusion in order to relieve his, uh, his uh, chest symptoms. Uh, and then uh, we, we decided in the clinical MDT that we have to go for diagnostic uh, thoracoscopy. We, we believe that that is the, the best way to approach uh, 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 the, the tissue diagnosis. And it ended up by uh, uh, this histology, non-small cell lung cancer, poorly differentiated adenocar uh, um, uh, CDK, uh, CK7, strongly positive, TTF, uh, strongly positive. And the molecular profile, we asked for a limited clinical profile that the way we do uh, at that time at least, uh, and it was pending, and the patient was treated being a smoker, heavy smoker, by chemo uh, uh, immunotherapy combination using carbopemetrixate uh, atazole. And the data at that time, they, 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 they showed that, that you can see in the Empower 132 uh, that uh, the, 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 when it comes to progression-free survival, it was highly significant in favor of the combination, like other combinations. So uh, after two cycles, uh, there was a marvelous improvement, further improvement of the patient with the status, clinical status with the overall good tolerance. Uh, and we, 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 we received the, the molecular uh, 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 profile that we, we had at the time. Uh, the pdl one was 60% uh, positive, and the vendor of, of, of this molecular profiling, they used the SP263, uh, which, is, which is the, uh, the one used for, uh, for Durva, uh, Durvalumab, not uh, Atezo. And we knew that at that point in time that uh, the, the, the one used for Atezo, which is SP142, um, does not really match with the tumor uh, uh, expression of PDL1. Neither the, the, the immune uh, cells, the, 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 the four of them, they do not match well together. And the recommendation at that point of time of, uh, 
of the blueprint that we should not uh, mix and match the essays with the drugs. You have to use the drug with the, its, its own essay, which we did not do anyway. The patient was responding, and that's how it looked after uh, three cycles of atezu uh, 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 and chemotherapy. You can see we have very good, partial, very impressive partial response actually uh, in all the disease disappearance of effusion on the right side and almost uh, uh, on the left side. And the patient was, was back to work, symptom free. And so the decision was to give one extra cycle. This will make four cycles of chemo plus immuno, and then we, we, we focus on uh, IMRT radiation with our radiation oncologist to the primary site in, in the left lung and the mediastinal nodes uh, with uh, dose re reduced chemo 30%. Uh, he tolerated the treatment well. Uh, the, the, the fifth cycle of chemo was, was deleted because of neutropenia, and then the patient was, was maintained on atezopemetrexate, which was removed later on because of neutropenia. However, after Nine months from the start of treatment, we started to have uh, early disease progression, which we thought at the first, uh, the first place that uh, it might be pseudo progression in, in, in the left lung lesion, uh, but the abdominal disease again, it increased, and, and the mediastinal nodes came back again. So we, we believe that if we, if we, if because uh, pemetrexate was removed, uh, we added uh, Beva to Atezo, uh, and actually, it worked very nicely in the lung lesions, as you can see after uh, addition of Beva. But again, we had more and more progression uh, at, uh, at the abdominal nodal disease. Uh, the patient again was non-symptomatic. So, with our radiation oncologist who has a stereotactic body radiation to the uh, to the abdominal nodes like this, and and actually after two months they disappeared. The patient was doing fine, and then. Uh, that's in November, after the, the end of uh, stereotactic radiation. He was in a very good partial remission. Three months later, uh, while under Beva and Atezo, there was another disease progression, uh, and we, we felt at this point that uh, we don't have extra uh, 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 therapy to, 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 to have a good rational, and the patient, uh, he decided to have an, uh, a foundation one uh, test uh, uh, that relief uh, uh, revealed that uh, the ALK rearrangement, which was negative by immunohistochemistry, it, it was uh, positive by NGS. And uh, the, of course, the, the question, would this happen actually? And I leave the answer to, to of course, the expert, and, uh, the, the expert molecular pathologist, but I will, uh, I will refer you to, to, this, uh, uh, to this report uh, just published a few, uh, few months ago. Uh, that uh, in, in, in this Chinese study, uh, they, 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 they have done ALK uh, uh, testing using uh, uh, NGS versus immunohistochemistry, and they found that uh, the, the two tests uh, were doing very good concordance in 78 percent, not, not, uh, not 100 percent, while <coughs> Actually, 18% of the population tested, they were NGS positive while they were immunohistochemistry negative. And I think uh, our patient actually was, uh, uh, should belong to this uh, population. Uh, and importantly, whether you test by NGS or immunohistochemistry, the overall response rate and, and the progression-free survival were the same. So according to this data, uh, we discussed with the patient what, uh, that uh, we, we need to, 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 to shift his treatment to electronib. Uh, and, and actually, we started this in, in the end of February, uh, where the disease progression wa was like this. And his last uh, uh, PET CT a few weeks ago was uh, in, in a very good partial remission. And by, do, by having said so, uh, I should really thank, of course, thank my team and, and thank the medical profiling because it could help us to, to, uh, to help this patient for one extra mile. I think it's a long mile to go with the, with the, the ALK positivity detected. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Hamdi. I think we've got uh, a couple of questions. The first question I, w I want to ask uh, is probably to Dr. Benedict. Dr. Benedict, if we have um, something like foundation one, and then there's the other several molecular profiling um, um, platforms, the ones that give you sort of a, a readout and tell you what to do with this uh, um, 
alteration that you have. So they give you options with that. Can that be so, as Professor Hamdi said, we don't have molecular pathologists uh, um, dedicated to tumor boards that are in, in many countries. Can that be sort of a substitute for that? Is that the way to start, or do we really need to have a molecular pathologist on board from day one? Because, as I said, the, the platforms and the readouts are actually quite extensive from, from, from this. So, so um, I would say there are two answers to this question. Um, if you are in the in-label um, realm, so uh, for example, you you do you test a colorectal cancer pay, uh, case, and you come back as KRAS um, wild type, so you can go for an EGFR-based therapy. There. Um, a foundation one test and um, or a garden or whatever test can give um, can give you um, the results needed and you can use that um, in your daily clinical practice from my opinion and that's why I feel we need um, um, a molecular pathologist or someone who's familiar um, as soon as you go into a an area where you have an alteration that is predictive in one disease, but you might maybe find it in another, BREF um, V600E, for example. I think um, these um, generic um, reports can be a little bit misleading or um, it can be difficult to interpret them. Same is for me, to be uh, quite honest. So it really helps to then reach out to, to peers. and. What I believe could be a good substitute or a way forward is, and, and I know that, that some companies are pushing that, but also some academic networks, is that you reach out to peers via a virtual molecular tumor board. And um, I mean, you now ha see me here. I'm, I'm happy to discuss such cases also on a peer-to-peer -peer basis with colleagues from all around the world to to really help. So, so building on the knowledge of your peers, if you're in a non-in-label realm, is is really um, the way to go, in my opinion. I, I think that's an offer so that we can uh, reach out to you when we, when we need you. Right, Dr. Giuseppe, I'll take you to Professor Hamdi's case. Do you believe that this ALK mu mutation is something new, or was it there from the beginning? Uh, no, I, uh, I think it, it's, a, it's a root mutation, so it sh sh should be there since the very beginning. From the beginning. Yeah. All right. And, and I think there is a lot of different uh, ALK antibodies, yeah. and uh, there are several papers in the literature showing that depending on the antibody used, especially if it's laboratory developed tests, the problem of sensitivity can really uh, appear. So, so what, so. You're, what you're saying, Dr. Uh, um, uh, Frederick, is that you think that the genomic profiling, especially in lung cancer, because of these uh, sometimes um, mutations that are skipped by the immunohistochemistry should be done by comprehensive genomic profiling from the beginning? No, what I, what I think it's, it can be a choice, but it has been proven that if you use um, good immunohistochemistry, so I, I mean by that assays, not diluted antibodies, ALK is extremely uh, sensitive and, and specific. We don't, we don't do fish if we have an ALK3+. Plus. And uh, uh, we have very few false negative with ALK. So um, uh, if you use those assays, I have published with others on that. And uh, so here, maybe it was a problem of immunostochemistry, maybe a problem of fixation. So, so then I think that in lung, as we have to look at ALK, ROS, uh, RET, uh, and other things where we need to, to do immunostochemistry and sometimes fish, it is uh, consuming a lot of tissue. So now, I think comprehensive gen uh, genomic profiling for lung is obvious for me. Uh, and we need also to, to, to drop uh, fish. We need to do everything by, by, uh, by molecular testing. The only thing we cannot do is PDL1. And R2, if we have to look at R2 low in the future, but, or R2 expression in lung. There but that's also, there for all also, the other things, we need uh, we, we, we need uh, genetic testing. 
There are also some new uh, new drugs like the um, G12 C mutation on the Keras when the drug comes in. I think that's only going to be seen if you do a genet uh, next gen sequencing, or can that be done also by immunohistochemistry or fish? No, 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 no. Just, no, no, has just, we have to do uh, just uh, NGS. Yeah. So I think that's going to dictate that everyone. Do you agree, Professor uh, uh, Benedict, that everyone will need NGS in the very near future for lung cancer? Uh, <clears throat> yes, most probably. I mean, um, one of the most important points. I mean, there are two points here. A, if you go stepwise. Um, we waste a lot of tissue, um, and especially if you do, do an uh, e, um, endobronchial ultrasound guided FNAs, there is very little tissue. So um, you might be um, you might run out of tissue after the second or third biomarker. And secondly, um, with all the n novel therapeutics coming to the market, at some point it won't be cost effective to do, even if you had a huge bulk of tissue. If you do 15 tests, um, especially um, if you go for multiple different um, fusion events that are quite um, frequent in, in um, non-small cell lung cancer, um, this will be far more um, expensive than having one um, run um, with your um, comprehensive genomic profiling approach. And last but not least, after you have covered all your bases with the standard of care, there might be genes or biomarkers on these um, NGS panels that will allow your patients to uh, go on to a clinical trial. So okay. all the trials that we've mentioned for um, ALK, for ROS, for NTRK, those were um, trials um, where you had to screen a lot of patients and those types of um, trials, um, yeah, still run and therefore, um, okay. yeah, we, we will uh, definitely uh, need comprehensive genomic profiling. Thank you. So Dr. Ham. Dr. Dr. Hamdi, from your case, have you changed your practice to doing next-gen sequencing for all lung cancer patients since this was something that you encountered? Has that, has that changed your practice? No, it, it, at the end it, it, it did not because, because we have a problem, as, as, as you know, for, for, for all lung cancer Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, Professor Am. Um, yeah. Yes. We we saw the case from uh, from Professor Hamdi. Again, we have in-house testing for ALK, EGF, R, uh, uh, ROS1, PDL1. I think, and that's because we have these drugs available in Egypt. The other ones we we don't have. But sometimes you get patients that you know are probably yes. well, yeah, they, 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 get are, they are positive. Get, sometimes so you get, get a young there. lady, and then you get her results. Uh, Non-smoker, you get an EGFR that is wild, an ALK that is wild, and you're probably doubting the results. Would you send these patients for an NGS? Yes. Well, well, I'm I'm a strong believer that uh, a piecemeal approach of doing like repeated testing, it, it doesn't doesn't work. It simply doesn't work in reality. In real life, it doesn't work. It will you will come down with someone that's completed, uh, not done. So you have an incomplete uh, uh, view of the case. Uh, I am. I think that. The only logical, and I'm talking specifically about lung cancer here, is that the only logical thing is to go like a comprehensive as much as possible, as early as possible. Right. Because it's not going to help you only with your uh, first line treatment. Last, this will make you a, a proper plan the last for, question to you, for, for, um, for uh, all things. Sorry. The last question to you, um, if you get uh, a patient that uh, you started off chemo, then you get your genomic profiling. Do you shift to the ALK or do you continue well, well, on the Well, it, it's according to the results I see. Right. I, I do not usually just shift once the results just have come. All right. 
I have depending on two, the response of the two patient. players that can affect my decision. One of them, uh, if I see some outcomes, this this will definitely will affect my uh, outcome of uh, my decision. Another thing, if there is a maintenance approach, so if I start with a treatment for some reason, maybe, if uh, maybe. like the ca case with Dr. Hamdi has like pericardial effusion, it's really very risky. Maybe I I'm, and we are sending the the test for outside of Egypt, so it's gonna take time. So I really need to start. I usually will start with chemotherapy as simple as possible thank, uh, thank uh, you. because I'm not sure about the timing and the stability of the case. However, if it turns out to be a driver mutation that, can, uh, uh, that we can give it a uh, TKI, for example, I might switch on maintenance to it. Thank you very much, Al. Uh, Professor uh, Frederic, please, I know you have two cases to share. Please. Yes, I don't know if we will have time to, to go through them, I'd but let's, let's at see least start, some let's way start to off with share the first my screen. One. Yeah, let's start off with the first one. Okay. So, can you see my screen? Yeah, I think you need just to put it in full I screen. You do, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> you cannot see my screen. Okay, so... Uh, I have a problem. I cannot see my screen. Just something. Okay. So, if I do that, you. Oops. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is uh, the case of uh, um, a 60 years old, uh, um, 60 year old lady, um, non-smoker with no family history of cancer, and she presented with a, a large axillary mass. Um, with an absence of breast lesion. She had the mammography, MRI, everything. So nothing, um, so she had, a, she had a biopsy. The biopsy showed a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. Uh, EME, uh, so this is the, the, uh, the uh, immunostochemistry profile. So it's, uh, it confirms the adenocarcinoma. It's not from uh, colorectal origin. It's not from lung. And the GATA3, that is specific for breast, but, but not specific for breast, but that is usually positive in breast cancer, is negative. Um, uh, um, it was not uh, with mucus. It was PAX8 that could uh, also bring to uh, gynecologic uh, and uh, WT1 was, were also negative. Um, so um, um, this was a, a cup. Uh, with uh, uh, immunostochemistry, we were not able to, to show uh, any kind of profile. And uh, um, um, the patient uh, was treated by uh, Taxol Carbo, and she uh, experienced a complete remission. Um, uh, we, uh, in parallel, uh, from the beginning, we, uh, we run uh, FMI test. And uh, in fact, uh, in the FMI test, it was found that the patient had a BRCA uh, deleterious mutation. And that was confirmed uh, uh, after that by uh, uh, the germinal uh, level. So it was a germinal BRCA mutation. Um, and she had alteration in two other genes. Uh, one gene that is involved in transcriptional response to progesterone signaling. And another gene that is uh, rare, rarely uh, um, activated, but uh, at the highest frequency of activation for, was in, in breast. And maybe, but we have no proof of that, uh, um, uh, it could be uh, breast cancer because the immunostochemistry gets free can be negative in some triple negative breast cancer. One year later, after the end of treatment, uh, the patient started to progress. Uh, 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 cervical lymph node progression. And you can see uh, different uh, uh, aspects. So the multidisciplinary tumor board decided uh, Taxol Carbo, uh, followed by Olaparib, because it was not easy for us to get Olaparib at, at this moment. So we had to make special requests. And it was not reimbursed, so we started by the Taxol Carbo. And uh, 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 this is our last uh, uh, um, um, uh, examination in uh, December of this year, so two years later. She has a, a stable partial response uh, since two years, so with Olaparib. Um, there is no sign of progression elsewhere, and it's very well tolerated. 
So this case is uh, um, showing the use of comprehensive molecular uh, testing in patients with uh, uh, unknown uh, uh, primary, with carcinoma of unknown primary. Uh, if you so want this, to discuss uh, this so case. FMI in this case helped in the diagnosis that this is a breast cancer patient. Is that correct? It's, it, it, it can be maybe an, uh, uh, you know, um, an ectopic uh, breast gland in, uh, in the axilla, but she never had anything in her breast. She's, she's, uh, uh, she has mammography every six months. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, MRI, so we didn't find anything in our breast, and this was the only only loca uh, localization. Doctor, Doctor Hamdi, w would I need if I got from FMI, as in this case, a BRCA mutation? Do I need to reconfirm it with the germline testing? Would I would I need that? No, in France we need for Olaparib. We need uh, ah, you to need have germline for all uh, But, but do, I need, do I need to redo it after FMI comes in as positive? Yes, because it's somatic. You, you cannot you cannot know if it's germinal or or, or, or somatic. Okay, so that's why we retested. Time we we, 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 we used to give olaparib only for patients for with uh, with germline mutation. Now we know that you can use it in. Somatic after the last ASCO, uh, in, in patients with, uh, with somatic mutation as well. But at that time, in order to, to have the uh, 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 given to the patient, she has to have, uh, like uh, the, the two studies, the, the um, uh, Olympiad and the, the Embraca. Okay. So they mandated the germline mutation rather than tumor mutation. Now, with tumor mutation, you can do the job. Okay. The, the second thing. Uh, or question uh, to, to you, Professor Frederick. If this patient progressed, would you do another FMI for her? No, I don't think so. Dr. Doctor Benedict, would you do another FMI for her when she progresses? It's, it's breast cancer, so we have no so many options of uh, other alteration that could be oh, targeted. Okay. So in yeah, breast cancer... I would say so as well. This is most probably... Um, a breast cancer-like cup, yeah. um, so I would treat according to to uh, as if this was a breast cancer in the end. Then, and um, even with a um, an evolutionary pressure um, with um, platinum chemotherapy and then um, olaparib response, there is usually not that much popping up in in breast cancer um, under selective pressure. There are other diseases where you might have more diversification, but I don't think that this would be informative in so the end. So the, quest, the question to you is, which diseases would you do repeated FMI testing in when they progress? Lung, colorectal, which ones? Well, I mean, um, so so if 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 I had um, comprehensive genomic profiling in a patient at the get-go, let's say a colorectal cancer, wild type, um, left-sided, and we start uh, anti-EGFR um, double chemo, and this patient rapidly progresses and something is off then I would um, redo um, comprehensive genomic profiling in selected cases. Um, so, it, 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 so in most it of the cases on where how, I how, order, how, sorry, just, just to, to, to give a little bit of a background, in most of the cases where I order comprehensive genomic profiling, um, most of the standard biomarkers have been tested um, during uh, or during standard workup, and these patients have seen at least one or two lines of chemotherapy. Um, we are moving to first-line treatment in metastatic disease in a lot of patients, but I feel the justification to do another comprehensive genomic profiling, both in terms of cost effectiveness and in terms of what we can expect, is not there yet. So, um, but, uh, if it was dirt cheap, yes, but at the moment not. Can I, can I jump in here? Uh, uh, Professor Amr Shafi, um, according to uh, someone like Professor Barlizi in, in lung cancer, 
he tends to do genomic profiling every time the patient progresses. What's your take on that, Amr? Well, as, uh, uh, as Professor Benedict, uh, uh, there is a financial consideration, so of course... Uh, but then again, financial oh, uh, consideration yes. with drugs that are 10 times more expensive than doing the test, so... If I'm going but to you, you are looking to specific uh, resistance alterations uh, well, if you have targeted therapy, so you don't yeah. need to profile uh, all the genes. You uh, need yeah, to well, profile ALK or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, there is actually, Dr. Mohsen here is a point that we, again, I, I cannot really say that this should be a standard, or, or maybe it is in the future. It's actually, it's about, if you're doing like a, a sequential liquid uh, comprehensive uh, profiling, yes. you might go into a little bit deeper into precision medicine where you actually follow the log reduction of the mutation uh, of, and the load, and you get some time of behavior. However, I think this is more of a, um, a, less a research or a scientific um, approach or a mindset. In, so, in certain private patients, I actually, we did this <laughs> if, if, because it's out of pocket, uh, no reimbursement issues. However, we, the patient have, have to have realistic expectations of what we are doing. It's more or less of a prognostic approach and still in a research um, uh, science-based uh, situation, not real benefit to the patients. Uh, at last least last question to Professor Hamdi. Professor Hamdi, liquid biopsies how confident are you with the results for NGS and liquid uh, I, I think I was just going to ask our, our international panel about that because uh, uh, I think liquid biopsy is, 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 uh, is the way to go for many patients where you, you don't have real tissue to, uh, to utilize for uh, genomic profiling. So my question to the three panelists, uh, uh, the experts is, uh, uh, First, why, why do we have always less sensitivity when it comes to, to liquid biopsy compared to, to, to the tissue NGS? Uh, and uh, second, uh, would, would you utilize, if it is liquid biopsy negative, uh, do we still insist of having a, a, a tissue in order to confirm the negativity? When it is positive, uh, the mutation, yeah. then uh, that's the good news. But when it is negative, it, is, it should be the end of the road, so let's, or let's what? Take, let's take this to Dr. Giuseppe. Dr. Giuseppe, liquid no, biopsy... Is that it depends on the type of mutations that you are looking for, but in general, if I have to, to make a general statement, in case of positive, I'm happy. In case of negative, whenever it is possible, I will go back to the tissue. And it's recommended, uh, for instance, uh, uh, by for uh, P3CA or uh, some tests that we, that we look at very simply by liquid biopsy. I completely agree. And it's very complicated for fusions. Um, if you look for uh, gene fusion on liquid biopsy, uh, you really need to have a lot of uh, circulating. Uh, but but my, my question for you uh, as expert uh, molecular pathologist, uh, uh, Frederick and Dr. Viali, do you think that uh, we, we will witness some uh, improvement in the outcome when it comes to sensitivity and detection rate for, for liquid buffs? I mean, would the near future witness a uh, better outcome of this approach? Probably. Yes, I, I, I think, um. it, yeah. Uh, we always see uh, uh, advances in these uh, technological fields. Uh, so I think that in the future it will be more and more commonly used, uh, despite the fact that possibly uh, it will never attain the same sensitivity as uh, as with tissue. Just and you probably, sorry. Um, no, no, go ahead, Fred. And and you probably need at one point to have tissue also to look at PDL1 or to look at also to some uh, special ar arrangement in the tumor. And also, if we go back to lung, when you have resistance to some uh, targeted therapies, you have a switch to a small cell profile. It's the same in prostate cancer when you have also resistance to endocrine. And that, for the moment, uh, you, you, need to, you need to have morphology to, to say that. You cannot say that by, uh, by, by um, circulating uh, um, uh, sure, DNA. So some aspects are still important, but I think that for monitoring resistance, it's very important. And in my hospital, as probably in 
years, if we cannot have access to tissue at all, uh, or if we try to biopsy one or two times and it's impossible and the patient says stop, we go to liquid biopsy and we try to be as large as possible to, to be sure to capture something. But uh, uh, otherwise, I think it's good at, at least at the beginning to have a, to have a, a tumor sample. Yeah, I think that uh, as long as we will learn uh, how to identify patients where the uh, different metastatic sites are heterogeneous, in that case, since we will not know which metastasis has to biopsy or no, so liquid biopsy for those patients with tumors highly heterogeneous in the metastatic sites, a liquid biopsy may be a step forward. Okay. Thank you very much. I think this is, this is all the time we have. Thank you, Professor Benedict, Professor Verli, Professor uh, Frederic, Professor Amr Shafi for your inputs. Professor Hamdi, thank you for being here with us uh, today. And thank you to the audience who've been uh, with us in this uh, Foundation One uh, Symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you. Ciao. Yeah. <laughs>